uh, Paul is going to talk to us about um, Flurry, which is a very, very large scale analytics platform for mobile devices, um, hundreds of millions of them concurrently, in fact. Um, and Paul's going to give us an inside look at uh, what's going on in his world with that kind of data volume uh, and what we can expect to hear from him uh, at Strata next month. Paul. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, can everybody hear me? I, I assume that's going to be yes. Um, so, yeah, so uh, I'll just kick it off from here. As, as he said, I'm, I'm from Flurry and we do uh, mobile analytics and, uh, and we take in a lot of data. Um, so I, actually what we do is mobile analytics and advertising. So advertising is the other big space where people are doing a lot of big data stuff. You're talking about very, very high volume. Um, so we, we offer this on, on a bunch of the different platforms. This is on iOS, so it's iPhone, iPod Touch, iPad, um, and Android, including the Kindle Fire, um, which a lot, of, a lot of times when you see stats from Google about the Android market, they're actually excluding things with the Kindle Fire. But the thing is we get coverage on that because we have apps uh, reporting in analytics from that as well and Windows Mobile and BlackBerry and soon uh, HTML5. So the truth is at this point this talk should be called something more like analytics from 400 million smart smartphones. And, the, and 400 million is actually just one month. That's the number of unique devices that we see in a month. Um, at the time when I put this talk together it was 330 million and basically that's that's kind of how quickly the mobile space is growing. So here's a chart that we put together that shows the current, the current size of the mobile market. And obviously the U.S. is on top there with about 109 million devices. Uh, and this is, sorry, it's the smartphone mobile market. So that that's previously. Um, so, but the thing is, even though, even though the mobile market is already pretty big, there's a lot more room for growth. So we, we had done some analysis about for, for the different markets in the world, how, how many potential enough disposable income that they could purchase uh, a, a smartphone or a tablet within, you know, within the next year or so. Um, so uh, no surprise here, we can see that the biggest, the biggest opportunity that we're projecting is, is actually in China. And more and more, we're seeing uh, analytics traffic coming, coming from China. So uh, I'd like to talk, you know, about Flurry's big data and how we, how we manage this load of now, it's about 1.2 billion sessions a day. Um, so let me, let me talk about what a session is and, and what that means for us. Uh, and also just a quick aside about the, about the size, 1.2 billion sessions a day, that is just growing incredibly fast. We had done in, in November, a bunch of us and a bunch of the engineers in the company were taking that Stanford machine learning course and we decided to do a prediction about when we'd hit a billion sessions a day because at that point we were doing about 850 million. And we predicted it'd be right around tax time, and actually we hit a billion sessions a day right before the new year. So it's the growth of the data is actually outpacing what our, what our projections were. So really quickly, a session is all the activity of a user that, that for an app that is using Flurry Analytics. So the flow for that is, the user starts up the application and it makes the, the Flurry Analytics SDK makes a connection to our servers uh, and if they're also doing advertising it says, hey, do you have ads? Um, the user does a bunch of stuff and the developer of the application can log custom events and stuff like that. And all of those get cached locally on the phone and then reported at a later time. So usually that's when the user goes to the home screen when they quit the app the report comes in. So that, that whole thing is a session and we're doing now during peak days, uh, which are actually Sundays, um, about, about 1.2 billion sessions. So the tools that we use to manage this, this amount of data uh, is pretty, you know, it's pretty standard. 
We use Hadoop, obviously. We use HBase for the structured data so that you can actually pull up, you know, answer queries about analytics, about what your users are doing. Uh, Java is the back-end, like, server-side code that we're using. And we actually use a bit of MySQL for more, more static, smaller-scale data, like what, what applications are using our analytics, uh, what ad campaigns are running, and what type of custom segments uh, that the analytics users have actually um, defined. So we run all of this on uh, commodity hardware. We actually have two separate data centers uh, with a total of about 700 servers, that may be more now. Um, and so we actually rack our own servers, which is, I think, pretty interesting because a lot of people now when they talk about big data, they instantly make an association to cloud computing platforms like EC2 and, um, you know, stuff like that. You don't think of, of big data people actually running their own gear unless it's like Google or Facebook. Um, so for us, we may, there are a few things that drove us to like run our own hardware. One, like we had an ops team that was very capable to do that. But the truth is for our, for our needs, our processing isn't elastic. Uh, we don't get a benefit from, like one of the benefits for running say S3 and Elastic MapReduce in, you know, Amazon Web Services is you can store all your data in S3 and then just spin up a Hadoop processing cluster whenever you need it and then you know, shut it down when you're done, like, doing your analysis and you only pay for that time. Uh, but we are not elastic. Our MapReduce jobs run, and the second they're done, they kick off again to just keep processing the data as it comes in. We're basically, like, running these nonstop. We don't, we don't run it at night to process things. We just want the, we just keep cycling through it. So ultimately, because of that, we actually save money by running on our own hardware and because of the scale of what we're doing. Because, you know, to pay for 700 virtualized instances on EC2 every month can get pretty expensive, especially if you're paying for virtual instances that map to raw hardware, right? You have to, for a virtual instance to, to equal like the level of raw hardware, like it has to be much, much more powerful than, you know, your standard like EC2 small or maybe even large instance. So the, the architecture, what this looks like, um, hopefully people can see, kind of see this, this diagram. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to address each piece uh, in turn, but basically this shows the full cycle. It goes from handset to raw data in our system to uh, a processing pipeline to being shown on a web interface where people can report on, you know, get reports on what users are doing in their app. So first, uh, I'd like to talk about, uh, you know, just the handset itself, like collecting, collecting data from the handset. So one of the concerns for us is we never want to lose data. We always want to get it at some point. And the thing with, about analytics is it's still valuable even if you don't get the data, like even if the data comes in, say, days after it was initially gathered. It's still data that you want and you can report on and gain intelligence from later on. So the first thing we do to make sure that we don't lose data is everything that happens gets stored locally on the phone until it's actually been pushed up to our system. So there's always like a, a local storage component on the phone. Uh, and then when it can, it reports up to the Flurry. The Flurry server is like, okay, here's, here's this session report. The user had clicked on these various things, or if it's a game, like advanced in these different levels. Um, and whatever, whatever the events are that they've, that they've set up. So when it comes in, we're running just basically Java servlets and running on Jetty servers. Uh, and the first thing it does is it just writes the data immediately to disk. Uh, we're not trying to do some like service thing where we call out to some other service. The goal here is that these, these collection agents are, are basically, they're, they're as simple as they can possibly be. Uh, and they're completely distributed. So we have a bunch of them running, they're behind a load balancer, and we can lose any one, any one and 
you know, we'll, we'll still be collecting data. We won't have a problem. We can bring it back up. So they pull the data to disk to make sure that it's, it's stored somewhere and then get a response back out to the handset, okay, we've got it. And then another process picks up that data and then loads it into our processing pipeline. So the start of the processing pipeline is just getting the raw data into HDFS. So uh, once that's done, there's another process called the data log processor. So we have a custom like log format. Originally we had designed this to save bandwidth on the mobile devices because when we first started doing analytics, that was, that was actually a concern. So this data log processor picks up the raw data, transforms it, and then stores it into HBase. So it's a bit more structured at this point. So that actually happens in a MapReduce job. And that's one of those things where the whole MapReduce job runs, it goes through all the data, and then it just kicks off again as soon as it's done. So then we have another MapReduce job that picks up the data once it's made it into HBase. And that's the job where we actually compute all the metrics and we actually figure out, okay, what are the number of sessions for last month? What are the number of sessions for you know, the last week? Uh, we have things where you can define custom segments like users who've completed these certain actions in the application and you can see in aggregate what users like that have done and what their usage patterns are. So that's a MapReduce job that pulls the data from HBase, does all those roll-ups and then outputs it again into another HBase table. So that's that's all the processing, so then at that point we can actually answer queries like all those ones I was talking about. Uh, how many sessions, what the users are doing. So this is all shown in the, you know, in just basically a web application. And this is the point in which we actually bring MySQL into the picture because we pair it up. You know, obviously when they're logging into the web app, they're, they're logging it, their credentials are checked versus, you know, what we have in MySQL and all this other stuff. So. That's pretty much like the whole life cycle. That's the whole pipeline for us processing data. So one of the things that I'm going to be talking about next month is, is also how do we go real time? Uh, and actually, uh, it's a question for us of whether or not it's worth the cost to go to real time. Because to be able to process all this stuff in real time is, you know, it's increased complexity in terms of engineering, and it could be actually more expensive in terms of just raw hardware that we have to run to, to store and process all the data. The thing about analytics is the usage pattern is that people, people generally only log into the analytics portal, you know, once a day or once every other day or once a week. So really, like, do we need to be real time? Do our customers need that, that level of, of reporting? So obviously, like, since we have a lot of data, we, we want to we wanna analyze it and we want to we wanna run different algorithms over it. Uh, I won't talk about the specific algorithms right now, but I'll definitely be talking about it next month. But some of the things we do, uh, just a brief overview of what we do with this data, uh, we do app recommendations. So as I mentioned, we're, we're, we have an advertising network, and the advertising network is, you know, if you build an app and you want to get people to install it, you put it, you, you run ads here. So based on our usage data, we say, okay, who, who can we recommend the app to that is actually likely to, to, to install it? You know, it's not going to be spam. One, they obviously already have it. And two, you know, based on the other apps that we know they already have, will they like this app? We also do uh, gender estimates. So for some, of, for some of those 400 million devices, we know what the gender is. And we, we do it by device, not by, not by specific user. So we've actually built a model to estimate for, you know, I mean, the vast majority of the 400 million devices we actually don't have gender labels for, so we built a model to estimate what the gender is for all those other, other devices. And we do the same thing for age. We actually bucket it into age categories, so there are six different buckets. Um, and finally, persona. Is this a person who likes real-time strategy games, or is this a person who likes daily deals apps or do they like restaurant apps or, you know, stuff like that. So it's really trying to build a persona 
around what kind of apps they have on their, on their phone or tablet. And all of this leads to ad targeting. Basically, how can we show users ads that are more relevant to them, they're going to be less, you know, less of an annoyance. Um, and lastly, one of, the, one of the other things that we've actually used our data for uh, that's been quite effective is really just marketing for the company. Um, our marketing team will put out a blog post either once a week or once every other week, and it's, it's usually about trends that, you, that we, we're seeing in the data about, say, growth of the Android versus iOS or growth of China versus, you know, the U.S. or whatever, uh, or what users are likely to make in-app purchases. Uh, and it's actually been quite a fair about Flurry as a company. We just mine that data and put all that stuff up on, uh, on our blog. So that is about it for me. Thanks a lot, and I will see you next month. All right, thanks a lot, Paul. Um, we did have a couple of questions for you if you've got a couple of minutes. Um, we had a couple of people oh, that absolutely. asked stuff in chat. Okay. Uh, so first one, uh, Susan Straub asked, how do you decide how long to keep the raw data that you've collected and how long do you keep it available? So we actually haven't thrown out any raw data yet. We, so the, the, obviously like the growth pattern for our data has been exponential. So we've actually gathered more raw data in like the last two months than we have in the entire history of the company. So. Uh, give me a second. I actually have a stat for how much raw data we have right now. So we have uh, about real, real time <laughs> analytics on a conference call. That's pretty good. <laughs> so we have about 96 terabytes of raw, like compressed data logs, uh, and our current storage capacity is, is, is much more than that. So we, so far, we haven't had a need to throw out any of the raw data, which is nice because change what metrics we want to report on, or if we change, if we change anything about our logic behind the MapReduce jobs, we can always replay across that entire raw data set uh, and not have to worry about, you know, being able to bring up the stats on the front end to, you know, so that people can see their entire history versus just left. Yeah, awesome. And, and one of the things that, that seems to have come up a lot is the idea that because we have so much data, we no longer need to get, um, we no longer need to get the um, the algorithm perfect because we, with more data we can go with a much more simple algorithm and sort of run it differently later versus in the old days where the data was so precious we had to make sure the algorithms are exactly right. Any thoughts on that? I mean, you talk about rerunning the data later. Uh, actually, I, I totally agree with the algorithm thesis, the, or the more data beats better algorithm thesis. Like Norvig. I think Norvig is the one who famously said that, you know, years ago. Um, and I actually agree with that. The models that we use for, you know, estimating gender and uh, actually even just targeting uh, which users will install which apps, they're relatively simple. Like, they're the kind of things that you learn in an undergrad machine learning course. It's not like something that you need a PhD to put together. Uh, we have we just have the advantage of having such a huge data set that, uh, that we can get a lot of mileage out of really simple methods. Yeah, definitely the idea that lots of data democratizes the, the, the ways in which people can make useful predictions because more data beats good algorithms. I like that. Uh, and uh, just one quick point, uh, Micheline Casey asked, and you may have addressed this, but who are the customers for your data? Do you want to just clarify that for the audience? So we don't, we don't sell the data to, to third party or anything like that. So the customers are the people who are actually using it. So uh, if I'm a mobile app developer and I create an app, then I'll use, you know, I'll bring in the Flurry Analytics SDK just to report on stats on my own stuff. Um, so basically the, the customers for the data are the people who are actually putting the, the, who have opted to put the data into their system, right? So. Um, you know, if I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I can name specific names. We may have some on the website, um, but yeah, that's it's it's basically like analytics, like Google Analytics or something like that. So. All right. 
Well, Paul, we're, uh, we really appreciate you opening the, opening the kimono like this on a conference call, and uh, I know you're going to be doing it even more um, insightfully um, at Strata next month, but I really appreciate you spending some time with us today and, and uh, showing us what's going on under the hood.